Hello, I'm Professor McCoy, and today I want to talk about Thomas Aquinas's view of virtue, and specifically the importance uh, or the significance of seemingly insignificant actions for the development and cultivation of virtue. Uh, and as, as usual for a lot of these, uh, my primary source is going to be Ralph McInerney's Ethica Thomistica, uh, The Moral Philosophy of Thomas Aquinas. And specifically, I'll be looking at uh, chapter six, Character and Decision, where he discusses uh, the impact of virtue and the impact of action upon virtue, how these work as a sort of uh, a sort of feedback loop. Uh, now, as we look through the sort of history of virtue theory, uh, it is impossible to discuss virtue near, it's almost impossible to discuss virtue at least, uh, without at least referring to Aristotle. And of course, if you know much about uh, McInerney, and particularly McInerney's reading of Aquinas, you'll know that most of the time at least, uh, at least the overwhelming majority of the time, McInerney reads Aquinas as basically an interpreter of Aristotle, that whatever Aquinas said is basically what Aristotle meant. Uh, this is known sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek in academia as the McInerney identity thesis, the identity of Aristotle and Aquinas in terms of their uh, their overall thought. However, this is a, a nearly unique place where McInerney draws an important distinction and shows a difference between the thinking of the two philosophers. Because, uh, as he lays out in this chapter, and as we can look to if we look at the actual history of uh, history of philosophy, we find that Aristotle's idea of virtue is significantly tempered when it comes to Aquinas, whereas Aquinas uh, puts far more emphasis on the actions themselves and their concordance with reason and natural law. So what do I mean by this? If we look to Aristotle's notion of virtue, virtue is what makes an action right or wrong, virtuous or vicious. So there are actions which are virtuous, in other words, actions which are performed by a virtuous individual, and they are they come out of that person's virtue. They're inspired by that virtue, and they develop from that virtue, and they're outpouring their actions that come from the virtue itself. And there are vicious or evil actions that come from either a vicious individual or a person's vice, and it could be either or it could be both. So it could be that a virtuous person is acting viciously, acting in a way contrary to their virtue. That would certainly be evil for Aristotle. However, it's also important to note that at least per McInerney's reasoning, and I think he's largely correct here, that for Aristotle, it would be inappropriate to say that the good actions of a vicious man were in fact virtuous actions. They're not. They are actions which are correct, they're in alignment with the natural law and with reason, and they are, if they are continued, and if the uh, vicious man continues to act in this way, they are steps toward the cultivation of virtue, but the actions themselves are not morally praiseworthy because they are not virtuous actions. They are not actions taken from a place of virtue by a virtuous man. And so again, for Aristotle, the emphasis here in all uh, moral judgment, the emphasis is on virtue, on the character traits themselves. These stable habits or dispositions by which we we ordinarily and easily find ourselves acting. <clears throat> now, Aquinas has the same idea of virtue, that a, a virtue is a character trait or a disposition or a habit of character such that actions follow from it. It makes certain actions easier, uh, easier to, to accomplish. Uh, they are done uh, more willingly and more in accordance with our uh, the ordinary course of things. Aristotle uses the term second nature, which Aquinas echoes, of course. Now, Aquinas, however, as we've looked, uh, as we've seen before, is more concerned about the actions themselves than about the character of the person acting. Now, the character of the person acting is of moral significance, and we'll look to why exactly, but it's not for the same reasons as with Aristotle. For Aquinas, it is the actions that matter. Good actions, so a, a good action, performed for the right ends and for the right ultimate reasons, is a good action, no matter who performs that action. It could be in character from a virtuous person, or it could be out of character by a vicious person. It would still be a good and morally meritorious action. By contrast, a virtuous person 
can also act out of character, can be surprisingly evil. I mean, McInerney uses a couple of examples of this, where he points out where how a uh, how an otherwise virtuous person might say donate to charity for the purpose of vanity, to to gain a good reputation. I mean, that would not be a virtuous action because it wouldn't be for the correct uh, the com correct remote ends. And of course, it would also be inspired out of the wrong habits of character, say a habit of vanity. Now, a morally good person who usually does act charitably could find himself in such a situation where he's doing something out of vanity, perhaps through some choice or perhaps through some effect of his peers or an organization uh, or simply an errant thought. Now, why this is important, why this still, the development and cultivation of virtue is still significant for Thomas Aquinas, is because our habits of character, our virtues and our vices, help us to act. They make action easier. They incline the mind, and, the, and therefore the will, towards certain goods more strongly, more fully, more readily, and without as much deliberation. So what we mean by this is that if we develop, say, a habit of, uh, of virtue, a habit of, say, courage, what that means is we will immediately and without thinking be able to act courageously, do the right thing in the face of danger. Whereas if we do not have that virtue of courage, if we, are in, if we instead have the vice of cowardice, we might still be able to choose to do the right thing through great effort, but it won't happen as a sort of second nature. It'll be far more difficult for us, and we're far less likely to do it. Now, he gives an example of the kinds of things that we can do to form our virtues, and how those virtues act themselves out, or at least are acted out, in our day-to-day -day lives, in our moral life. So, quote, In his autobiography, Bertrand Russell recounts an episode. One day he was out bicycling, he says, and suddenly it occurred to him that he no longer loved his wife Alice. Now, it is that suddenly that is of interest. So he goes on to examine why this is so strange, because it is certainly strange that one's, one's deep-seated sentiments of love for one's wife, for example, would so quickly, so suddenly, and so unexpectedly change when out for a bike ride. Uh, he goes on to ask, uh, to ask a question about this. He says, A man suddenly realizes that he no longer loves his wife, but the transition from faithful loving spouse to potential divorcee is scarcely sudden. In the halcyon days, uh, sorry, in the halcyon early days of wedded life, the honeymoon and beyond, a man strives and succeeds to see his life with reference to his beloved. He squelches impulses to act in a way inimical to their union. So he acts in certain ways, in other words, to encourage rather than discourage his love for his wife. Continuing on, uh, skipping ahead of ways. This achievement, that is the achievement of marital love, of course, uh, uh, sorry, this achievement is seldom a matter of deeds of a dramatic sort. A whole congeries of actions that, taken singly or viewed by an outsider, are insignificant, conspire to form an outlook, a shared outlook. So it is a matter of action in a day-to-day -day way, in a day-to-day -day basis, small actions, actions which seem to, uh, to an ethical observer, somebody who is trying to figure out the ethics of a situation that might seem morally insignificant, the kind of thing that, that is not worthy of moral judgment. It seems a kind of ethical indifferent. Continuing onwards, he says, What then does it mean to say that suddenly a man realizes he no longer loves his wife? Is this like succumbing to a virus? Getting a tan, a risk one runs when bicycling? One wonders who might be riding on the handlebars. Again, literally or metaphorically. What he's implying here, of course, is who, perhaps, or even what, is Russell, in this case, thinking of? What, uh, what prior decisions and what prior thoughts has Russell entertained that led him to no longer loving his wife, Alice? Continuing on, he says, a series of minor infidelities, perhaps scarcely approaching the status of velieties, 
imaginings, dreams, of elsewhere, and otherwise, brought on by disagreements of a more or less substantial sort, the encouragement of fantasy. These underlie the process. The process is gradual. The realization may indeed be sudden. So what he's getting at here is that when we, uh, when we make sudden, grandiose decisions, which we do sometimes, we suddenly realize that uh, that you've fallen out of love, say, or you suddenly realize that uh, that you no longer wish to pursue the career you're pursuing. You might have a midlife crisis, say. <clears throat> it is seldom, if ever, really so sudden. Really what's happening, almost all of the time, is that we act in a way conducive towards such a change throughout our lives, in these little instances, in the little things that we do. You can act either towards cultivating, say, a relationship with your spouse, thinking together, thinking of the other as one's spouse, or you can cultivate, uh, you can cultivate a disorder of a relationship, thinking of the old ball and chain, acting as a acting in a way to avoid uh, such uh, such happy moments together, say dwelling on negative thoughts or perhaps dwelling on on fantasies of a different sort so to speak by doing so you are gradually slowly and maybe even imperceptibly training your mind and training your character to stop thinking of your spouse as the one that you love and so this is what almost certainly happened with respect to russell who has kind of a reputation among philosophers of having been sort of a dick understandably of course uh, given this autobiographical detail we have. So, we find that these major decisions we make are not, in fact, major decisions made in the moment, but rather that most of our major moral decisions are made before they happen. We make these choices as we make the little choices throughout life that will then give rise to these major choices through our virtues or through our vices. This is where McInerney also points out another flaw in the way we usually think about ethics. Say, in other ethics classes, perhaps. Hopefully not mine. He says, too often when we take a course in ethics, we are given for analysis moral problems of an altogether too dramatic sort. You're marooned in a lifeboat with four others and a limited supply of food and fresh water. Days pass on the briny deep. Food runs low and water is at a premium. When is it permissible to eat the first mate? So we think of lifeboat scenarios, as they're called, or hard cases, or things like trolley problems as well. All of these sorts of cases are interesting in that they illustrate abstract principles in a clear light. However, they're not actually practical, they're not useful applications of practical ethics, of applied ethics. Because these are, as he says, he goes on, the problem with such problems is that they suggest that most of us have never yet confronted a moral problem and are unlikely to do so in the future, because you certainly will not, or almost certainly will not, be trapped in a lifeboat and faced with the possibility of cannibalism. Continuing on, if the moral life is made up of problems such as these, the moral life at best, or perhaps at worst, would look like a line disturbed at rare intervals by pips of magnitude. But what goes on in the interim? In the interval between moral problems of the dramatic sort, the answer has to be the moral life. And so his point here is that the moral life itself, where our morally significant actions take place, is not in these great grandiose decisions. It is in the day-to-day -day choices that we always, always make, usually without considering it. That those are really morally significant because those are the choices which are going to shape our character such that if and when we do encounter a morally, a, a big deal, say, moral choice or a hard case, that the character we have shaped along the way is going to make the decision for us. If you've made yourself courageous, you'll be able to act in the face of danger. If you've made yourself just, you'll know to do the right thing. If you've made yourself temperate, you will know not to go to excess unnecessarily. If you've made yourself prudent, you'll be able to act successfully in the situation, etc. This is the key, again, that our actions, our big picture actions, depend upon our little actions. And it's our little actions that we have direct particular control over. 
So take, for example, a, and I find, I find this to be actually a quite useful exercise. I encourage my students to do this as well. And you, if you consider yourself as such, um, to look to a situation in your life that you would think of as morally insignificant, as not having a real bearing on the moral direction of your life, as not having, as perhaps even, ethically neutral. For example, I have a cup of water. I may have had something else here. I may have had a cup of tea. I may have had a cup of coffee. I may have had it in a different beverage vessel. I may not have decided to drink it right now. I may have decided to use something else as this example. I may have decided to use, say, the color of sticky notes that I use to mark pages in this book, or this book. But the fact that I, one, have a cup of water here, and two, I'm using it as my example, these are seemingly morally insignificant decisions. However, by acting in a certain way, by choosing to have a glass of water while I'm delivering this talk to you guys online, I am forming certain habits. Now, this again, this particular thing may have no particular significance. The fact that I'm drinking water right now certainly has very little in terms of major impacts throughout my life or the life of anybody else. However, the fact that I'm drinking water may have something to do with the time I'm recording this. It's after 10 p.m. At the, at the moment right now. Having a coffee, for example, would probably not be the best idea. And if I were to encourage my habit, my occasional habit, uh, of drinking coffee late at night, that would lead to other problems down the line. It would lead to more and more of a reliance that I perhaps would develop on coffee. Having water rather than tea may have, again, something to do with my habits of preparation. Uh, again, because a glass of water is easily replenishable. And so if I need to go back and do additional takes, or if I need to do anything like that, refilling my cup of water is actually quite simple, whereas refilling a cup of tea takes significantly more time, significantly more effort. And so I'm choosing to act for the purpose of recording a video, say. And I'm choosing to prioritize this particular activity that we are now doing. Now, this is slightly significant, but it becomes all the more significant when the choices I'm making now start to change and shape the things I will go on to do in the future. Because if I am used to having coffee at this time of night, that's going to certainly impact my behavior going forward. If I get used to doing so and just find myself making coffee at 10 p.m. without having thought about it particularly, because that certainly could happen. I'm not developing particularly healthy habits, certainly. But if I have a nice glass of water as I sit down to do my work here, that, on the other hand, is actually quite healthy and quite conducive to a successful video, say. And if I were to continue doing so, the habits I might form by doing so, the, the choices of what I prioritize and what I do not, those will shape my choices moving forward because they'll make similar choices easier and different choices more distant and more difficult. So again, I encourage you to do this as well. Take some time to consider the moral significance of a seemingly insignificant or ethically neutral choice that you make today. Think about this and give it some thought. And think about what you might be making yourself into, what sort of habits you might be forming, what virtues you might be cultivating, or what vices you might be nurturing as well. So I'll leave you with that thought. So thank you for joining me, and I will see you next time.